right. So, um, chapter 16 opens up uh, some new stuff. And we're going to get away from beer and pizza and, and uh, other what we call private goods. So we didn't make this distinction before. We kind of put up the supply and demand curve and we said, here's the supply of corn, here's the demand for corn, and um, everything's happy. Right here where the two lines cross and we get, a, we get a price and we get a quantity and, and away we go. So now we're going to start using what we've learned so far and now start tweaking and twisting things, making them a little bit more interesting on relaxing some of our assumptions of that model because there's other goods that don't fit that mold very well. So that's what we're going to explore. And before we jump into those types of goods, I want to introduce the political marketplace. So if you guys pull out your sheet, sheets of uh, 2.10 is an outline of what we call the political market. Now, the private market with the supply and demand of the beer and pizza stuff was this one, right? Where we had two primary markets, the output market and the resource market. And we had private firms uh, producing stuff, and we had households that composed our consumers buying the stuff. The households own all the factors of production, so in the resource market, they're supplying labor. They're kind of the supply curve in the resource market, and the firms are buying their resources down here. So that's the general market, but now we're going to put kind of an interesting twist and think about the political marketplace. So first of all, notice our agents. We've got the government sitting over here, and we've got private firms and households over here, kind of on the same team, if you will, for this particular market. Um, might have different objectives, by the way, but they, they are still over on this side in terms of thinking about the flows. So what goes on in the middle is a trade. And we know that uh, there's people out there that give to political campaigns. Right? So I don't know how much you guys have given to political campaigns, but have you ever heard about that being subject to some scrutiny? So that we can kind of buy our politicians, that sort of thing. So we've got campaign contributions going this way as the green arrow, but notice also that what we're paying the politicians with is votes, right? So they're kind of... Uh, we are supplying, if we think about the supply-demand curve framework, the households and businesses are kind of supplying votes and campaign contributions. All right, now, a company can't vote, right? So we got to make that clear. A company doesn't have a vote, um, but they can organize together to make campaign contributions. Likewise, individual, private individuals can make campaign contributions, and only private individuals have the opportunity to actually vote. All right, what do we get in return? What are these guys supplying to these guys in return for that? So we've got public policy and goods and proposals. We have laws. Um, there might be uh, government tools of uh, subsidies and tariffs and taxes and all kinds of stuff, right? So we got all that government regulation and, and government policy as, that's being supplied coming this way, um, as well as just the general laws of the land. So that sets up kind of this political marketplace. Does anybody got any opening questions or comments about the setup? All right, so who are our players? Our players in the market are voters, so our agents, if you will, are players. Who are the agents in the political marketplace? We've got voters. These are people, of course, because firms don't vote. We've got voters, and I want to think about what their objective is. What is the objective of these voters who actually are people? 
So in economics, we always like to think about, well, what are you trying to do? What's your objective? What's your goal? And what's the most general goal that we have for the voters who are ultimately people? What are they trying to maximize? Welfare. Their welfare, which we called what in chapter 5? Or, or 7, sorry. Utility. Utility, right? Actually, it was chapter 8 even, I guess. guess chapter 7 was a different one. So chapter 8 was our utility function. So our objective is to maximize utility, which was our measure of welfare for them. This is their self-interest, right? This is what Adam Smith talks about. However they determine what makes them tick, uh, each person has their own utility function, and they are out to pursue their own self-interest in order to maximize utility. All right. Um, we've got the uh, firms, or businesses, And what's their objective? <coughs> objective is to maximize profit. Right. Now, some other companies may choose, a business owner might have some other objectives, some little side objectives or whatever. Um, but our baseline assumption is that they're out to maximize profit. All right, and so um, from the firm's perspective, um, government policy might be important to them, right? So one of the things that comes about here is that whether as a part of a cost of doing business, they can capture some of the politicians with some special interests, right? So it might be profitable, since they're out to maximize profits and not necessarily social welfare per se, <laughs> Then one question is, can they capture, let's put that in quotes, because this is kind of a theory, capture theory, can they capture um, the politicians with <coughs> campaign contributions? which in their eyes is just a cost of doing business. It might be one element that they can do to maximize profits, getting preferential treatment. Something we call crony capitalism in the uh, economics field. So crony capitalism. The crony part is kind of an old term that says, well, you got your cronies, right? Your buddies, your chums that you kind of hang out with. And crony capitalism would be that maybe it's a little more important of who you know rather than what you know. And maybe you can cozy up to a politician, pay them a little bit, and get some preferential treatment. Is that a good way to do business? Yeah? Can be, right? As long as it's not like under the table. Right? As long as it's not under the table, as long as it's legal. Goes on every day, we know that, right? That that type of thing goes on. And, and there are rules and laws on disclosure and how much you can do and what you can do and all that. So I wanted to bring that up because it might be a very good way to do business. Is it good for the United States? That's a different question. Is it good for the United States? Is it a good way for us to organize the rules of our island? Does that sound like a healthy thing to do? Not in a free market. Not in a free market, okay. I'd agree with that. Why? Why would that... Uh, why would that not be maybe the most healthy thing. What do you see? Some stuff that we've learned in the semester with competition. We went through the whole perfect competition thing. We, we saw the results of what we got. 
talk to me. Let's see. Uh, Mallory, give me a number between 13 and 17. Uh, 15. 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Brendan, what do you think? What do you think is that type of doing business? And by the way, I totally agree that it might be a profitable thing to do. That's why we see it going on. And the way I look at it is I think, well, if your role in life of this business, which is not a person, by the way, is to <coughs> maximize profit, and that turns out to be a good way to do it, I don't have any problem with an individual company doing it. I've got bigger problems with having the setup of our system that way. Why? What are your thoughts? Why is that potentially not so hot? I'm kind of confused on the question. Okay. Uh, so, who wants to put into words crony capitalism? Somebody other than Brandon. Sawyer? Like threatening, like personal. Okay, so we have uh, people who are supposed to be engaged in market activities, capitalism, free market capitalism would be the idea of voluntary trade among other people. You remember Tom and Jen on the island that we talked about so many weeks ago? How those two got together and traded and it was possible for both parties to be better off even though Tom was better at both things. It turned out to be advantageous for both parties to engage in voluntary trade. We could make both parties better off despite our unequal differences at the starting place, where Tom had higher skills in both, both parties could be made better off through free voluntary trade. This adds a new element to the system to where if you know somebody in the political system, you can get some preferential treatment. Why would that maybe not so be so good? All right, you're up, Frank. I want to hear from you. You were our lucky winner in the random number generator. Uh, you can't be wrong. Whatever you think comes to mind. So, so you've got you've got big business getting cozy with politicians to get favorable treatment. Wouldn't it sort of be like monopoly with power? They like have too much power. Good. So it could lead towards monopoly, you're right, so it, it, it dampens competition, right, for sure. What else does it do with the, the mix of government and the private, free, voluntary trade idea that we saw with Tom and Jen on the island? Oh, would the big businesses have like influence on who would be the politician leader leading the... They start, we start to converge private sector activities that we think have a lot of benefits according to the, all the stuff we've been studying. And then we've got the government intertwining together with it. And all of a sudden it's not quite as free as it used to be, right? We have the government potentially picking which company seems to be better than another company by giving these favorites out. It doesn't create a level playing field. With competition, We've got firms going at it with each other to try to get your dollars. And so the outcome then is through this heavy battle of changing quality, altering prices, bundling things together, you know, all the stuff that goes on, whoever stands and, and succeeds is the one that probably has been profitable. But those profits aren't there to stay if there's competition. Today's profit for one guy that had a great idea is not going to persist because there's other people that can maybe copy that idea or do that or enter the market and so it changes. We got this nice kind of healthy dynamic thing over time. The results that we found in perfect competition and monopolistic competition is that profits, economic profits, profits that are abnormally high go away, right? So that was kind of the beauty of competition is that we can kind of sit back and say, you know, is that a fair price for that? Next time, just ask yourself, is that a heavily competed product? If there's healthy competition of that product, then whatever the price is, if it's $110 or $108 or $42, you can kind of set back as a consumer and say, you know, we live in a pretty good system where there's a lot of competition, and I know that that's a 
fair price, or that's likely to be a fair price. It kind of changes our perception. Whereas if the price is 110 or 42 for that matter, whatever the number is, because somebody had deep enough po uh, pockets to capture the politician because they went to Harvard together, not to pick on Harvard, but Harvard or Yale or whatever, and so one guy's escalated through the political system and the other guy's escalated to Wall Street and now the two are still playing golf together and that's why they're so successful and the price is 110. That should make you guys feel uneasy as a consumer, right? You should be like, huh, maybe our system's not working so hot. That doesn't sound like a good idea. All right, other comments, questions on that part of it? All right, so that's our side of the, uh, of the one island here, the, the demanders, so to speak. On the other side, we've got a couple agents as well. And that is our politicians. Our politicians, what is their objective? Their objective is to maximize what? So a politician now, we're going to separate two different groups. We're going to get to the bureaucrats and the politicians. Politicians are elected officials. We put them into the office. Bureaucrats are the people who work for the government, and so they are a hired, that's just their job. They show up every day and they get paid X amount of money to be there to help facilitate the politicians. So the idea of the system is that we elect politicians into office. They have certain objectives or goals that are apparently coming from the majority of voters that put them in the office. But there's actually some management type things and operational issues that they need to put into place that they can't do themselves. They need help. Their help is the bureaucrats. So the bureaucrats, these are the um, employees of the government. So these are employees of the government. Politicians are the elected, elected um, officers or people, elected officials in the government. So back to what are they trying to maximize? What do you think the politicians, those people who got elected into office, what's their goal? What's their goal? Votes. Votes, right? So they want to maximize votes. Why? Once they get into office, what do they want to do? So they got their votes, they're into office. Popularity. They'd like to stay in office, right? So now their objective is to kind of stick around. Maybe they've got re-election issues that they're thinking about. So they're trying to maximize votes. And um, stay in office, which is kind of one and the same. But when they get in there, uh, boy, it's not uncommon now to uh, uh, think about people are just continually on the campaign trail, right? They get in and they don't stop. They're just out there still because re-elections. Uh, in some cases, two years away, in some cases, four years away, depending on the type of position you are. And, and you need that kind of thing to just keep going. All right, what about the bureaucrats? What is their, What are they trying to maximize? So objective is to maximize... What do you think? What I hear? Dylan, budgets, yes. Why budgets? You go to the back of the room here. Let me, let's see, what was our number again? 14? 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Marshawn. So employees of the government, why would they want to? I, I had Marshawn before. I want somebody new. Marshawn, had, he came up with the game theory thing. So we'll go to... Chance, I think I picked on you before. Uh, Trey? Trey, is that right? Yes. Am I saying it right? Okay. Trey, 
What do you think about the objective for the bureaucrats, people who work for the government? The answer was budgets, that they'd like to make budgets bigger. Why? So they can spend more money on campaign ads. Okay, um, careful with the campaign. The campaign ad is more up here, but I do agree that they'd want to spend more money. So why would they want to spend more money? To put us in debt. Remember, they work for the government. So when you work for the government, you get allocated a certain amount of funds. That's called your budget. So maybe your particular department is to handle, maybe you're the Securities and Exchange Commission for some reason. You're monitoring the stocks. And so you are uh, carved out of the big budget. You've got $100,000 to work with. The argument would be that your objective would be to get 110. You want to maximize your budget. You want to maximize that spending. And why? What, what, what's advantageous to them to have an increasing budget rather than a decreasing budget? What does that give them? Power is one thing, yes. What else might it give them? What's that? Possibly could lead to a larger salary. Job security. Job security is one I was looking for. Right? So power, job security, all these things kind of come into play where their incentives are to make budgets bigger. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have been paying attention to the macro type economy, right? And this isn't macroeconomics. Some of you had macro last time. But what's happening currently in the federal government? What's happening to these budgets? Have they been getting bigger or smaller over the last 30 years? Bigger, 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 bigger. And that's exactly what this type of theory would predict, is that that would be the natural prediction. If we're thinking like Adam Smith on how human beings are, that they're going to try to maximize their own self-interest, if you're a government employee, your self-interest says that job security, power, and other things, maybe even a bump in pay, would be that you'd want to maximize budgets. So they're sitting there with incentives to maximize budgets. By the way, there might be a couple good-hearted souls out there that you know, don't want to waste money, and they're, they're real diligent about their job and real careful and conscientious, and that's great if they're out there. But they're not, not everybody's out there like that, right? So it's possible that we could have somebody in there that's being conscientious. But so... Maximize budgets, um, meaning we want uh, more spending for their department, whatever their division, their department. Why? Because it gives them some job security, maybe some power. Right, a little more control over dollars and doing good for whatever their department is. Maybe a you know, bump and pay, which might kind of, I'll put that in question marks, but bump and pay. Um, it is somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy if, if we increase the budgets, we've got more to do, you're being worked harder, you've taken on more responsibility, and... I deserve a raise, right? So that kind of goes one and one the same potentially. Okay, so that's our that's our setup here for the political marketplace. I got a little video queued up. It's a short one, just a couple minutes. And I want to think about how we spend our money. We started off thinking about our. Um, our private markets, our private marketplace, like cheeseburgers and pizza and spending that we do on ourselves. So this one's called Four Ways to Spend <coughs> Money. Four Ways to Spend Money. Let's take a look. You spend your own money on yourself. The four ways we spend money on the second person. You spend your own money on yourself. You spend somebody else's money on yourself. You spend your own money on somebody else, or you spend somebody else's money on somebody else. 
Yeah, I uh, I don't think it was right wing though, because it's um, Bush and Obama both were on that screen. I uh, this is this is bipartisan type of analysis on. This is the last couple things you recommended that would be you would spend your own money on other people. Oh, okay. Our typical right wing. You just slid in very quickly at the end. Okay. All right. Well. Fair enough, yes, I, and I did probably, I don't know if that, I, the easy blog spot I don't think is um, yeah, necessarily political driven, but I'm not even positive of that, so very well could be. Other comments? <coughs> so, do you ever feel that way? Have you experienced that? Where you've got a certain amount to spend, or you you've got a dinner to spend, and it's like, oh, well, it's mom and dad's money, I can, I can go out to the dinner. If I was paying for it myself, I'd be getting that burger and fries, but lobster sounds kind of nice, right? Or if you're going out for a special dinner. So it's very much, I think, in our human nature and, and uh, uh, insightful on Friedman's part to think about how that applies to the market and the uh, overall provision of goods. All right, so our next topic um, builds on that. Now that we're thinking about how things have gone, and I want to think about the public good. There are many goods that the government buys, state government, city government, um, you know, we can look at the sidewalks that were installed in Ottawa here recently. Um, there's a number of different things that the government spends money on, but not all of those are public goods in econ class. So we have um, kind of some specific criteria that need to be met to be called a public good. So a public good for economics class is not just a government purchased good. So a public good has these two characteristics. A public good is non-rival. I'm going to kind of define a couple terms here to put non-rival 
And all this means is that more than one person can enjoy the good at one time. So more than one person can enjoy the good Um, without detracting from the enjoyment of others consuming the good. More than one person can enjoy the good without detracting from the enjoyment of others consuming the good. So we can all enjoy it equally together, kind of simultaneously. Okay, non-rivalry. So give me some examples quickly of some things that you can enjoy at the same time where the benefits that you're getting from the good can be enjoyed by other people at the same time. What's that? Free ice cream. Free ice cream. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Now, can two people enjoy the ice cream at the same time? Depends on how you know. See, that's where it, if, if the unit of ice cream is the measurement, which it normally would be, by the way, then the only way, if I eat the ice cream, it's possible that Sawyer could eat the ice cream, but... <laughs> it might come up in a different form. Oh, no. oh. So, what I mean by non-rivalry is that it's the exact same good at the same time, essentially. We're all enjoying the good simultaneously. A park? A park would have some benefits. So we can all enjoy the park at the same time where my enjoyment of the park doesn't detract from your enjoyment of the park. Unless I haven't showered that morning or something, we're too, walking too close together. Okay, other examples. Kelsey said the internet. The internet, right? So maybe we could have a congestion issue in this room where we all jump on Wi Fi at the same time and my enjoyment somewhat detracts a little bit from yours. So um, we're going to see some cases where there could be congestion issues, but in general, we could enjoy it. And certainly, if we looked at most generally the internet and you're not having on the same system, then yeah, we can all enjoy the internet simultaneously, right? Multiple people jumping on the website at one time uh, is possible. All right, so that's the idea of non-rivalry. So enjoyment at the same time, so let's add this as a kind of an extra clarifier so we don't go back to the, to the ice cream nastiness, that... Uh, Enjoy it's okay. Sorry. at the same time the same good. So you can see that we're talking about some unusual things here. And so maybe a park would be one example where there's a non-rivalry and you said the internet. That, that works fine for me too. Now, to clarify, or to, uh, to qualify, rather, as a public good, you need another characteristic, too. And that's called non-excludability. Non-excludable. So, um, the ice cream is excludable. In other words, if you go to McDonald's to get an ice cream cone, how does McDonald's <laughs> keep you from enjoying... How do they exclude you from the enjoyment of that ice cream? You have to pay. pay. You have to pay. So it's their thing. They give it to you. Then you can enjoy it, right? So it's possible to exclude non-payers of the goods. So when something's not excludable, it is impossible, impossible, or cost prohibitive. to exclude people who don't pay. People who don't pay for the good. So bad. 
<laughs> All right. Can you think of some things that, again, we have to kind of stretch our brain beyond beer and pizza now, right? Because beer and pizza and ice cream is all rival and excludable. Those are called <laughs> private goods. So now, what are some things that we can't exclude people from very easily? Where do we have situations sunlight. where people can get it? Sunlight, okay? So we can't enjoy, uh, or we can't exclude people from sunlight. Good. What else? Air. Air is pretty difficult to exclude people from. Okay, so air, sunlight. Anything else to come to mind? All right, we'll stick with air and sunlight here. So air. The ground. Sunlight. That'll work. That is true. Your argument is faulty. All right. So let's make a little four square of our own, but this one's different than the video we just saw. We're going to make our own little four square. And. It's not game theory either, even though it's going to look like it. I am positive. This one is just uh, so now we've got three different types of four squares you have to go for. All right, so what I want to do is um, put up our, our uh, definitions that we just went through. So I want to think about things that are excludable and non-excludable. And things that are rival and non-rival. So in this upper left quadrant, we have the stuff we've been talking about this semester. Beer, soda, pizza, chicken wings, all kinds of what we call private goods. So we call these private goods. Goods that are rival and excludable. Now, this quadrant down here is the public good quadrant. The public goods have to have both properties. So public goods are non-rival and non-excludable. So any thoughts on that one? We kind of listed these individually. These weren't necessarily, these went with the, the, the thing, but weren't necessarily public goods. Now we need both conditions, non-excludable and non-rival. The air. So on the air, um, if we think about the unit of air, we, we think about air being kind of full and plentiful, but if I suck in and then I blow it out, what comes out of my mouth? For those of you who had a little biology, what's that? Carbon dioxide. So the air goes in, carbon dioxide goes out. And we have a few California people here, right? Anybody near LA? All right, so LA is kind of known for what in terms of air quality? Smog. A little sucky air pollution, right? So some smog, and, and all of a sudden you start to realize that, hey, you know what? Air is kind of rival, right? Now, is it non-excludable? Can we exclude people from it? So is it excludable? No, right? But it's rival. So air falls into this quadrant. And what we're going to find is that other natural resources tend to fall into this quadrant. Like oil? Yes, possibly some oil once we... Uh, it might be possible to do some... Uh, exclu the, the tricky thing is the excludability. So. If you have property rights to the oil, the oil's in the ground, somebody's got it, so that one would probably be excludable. But before we drift too far, 
non-rival, non-excludable. There are some examples. By the way, there's one that the government provides and actually spends a decent amount of money on that is a true public good. Oh, education. Education. Rival. Yeah. Social security. So rival and excludability. Is it possible to have more than one person enjoying a lecture at one time where one person's enjoyment doesn't detract from another person's enjoyment? Oh, no, I enjoyed this environment. So you guys are all kind of doing a, a non-rival thing here with education. But is it excludable? Is it possible to exclude non-payers? Yes. Right? So we kind of, if there was a... People, a couple strangers in here, like, unless I invited them. What about like I could have our security guards come in and haul them away, right? Get this guy out of here. He's, what about he's like, not going to learn any econ today. Like, everyone has to go to like elementary school. Yeah. 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 All right, now you got to be careful. Okay, so the, the question was brought up what about elementary school? Now, the fact that it's provided by the government, does that mean that all of a sudden it's become non excludable? Excludable versus not. Now, we might choose to not exclude people, but that's different from the good being non-excludable. See the difference? So the good itself, education, we already claimed is excludable. We can kick people out if we wanted to. By government policy, we say that anybody can get a kindergarten education. Come on in. It's free, right? even though it really costs something. So we're choosing through policy not to exclude. That's different than the characteristic good. That's a subtle point that's important with all this. How about another big government? So Kelty, that was good in terms of that is a, a big part of government spending in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, and we will come back to that issue later in a different way. National defense. Right. Start thinking about terrorism and the war on terrorism and protecting our country. So, let's test it out here. <laughs> is my consumption of national defense going to take away from your consumption of national defense? If the no. Army decides to so it's non-rival, right? So I can enjoy national defense if we have five nuclear warheads in our arsenal right now pointed at the bad guys. We're all enjoying those missiles together, right? <laughs> at the same time... The same good. The good is national defense. We're all enjoying it simultaneously. It is truly non-rival. Now, is it non-excludable? We have to pay for them to not yeah, shoot us. Okay, yeah, what about that? We have to pay for them not to shoot us. How do we pay for it? How do we pay for having taxes. the bad guys not be able to shoot us? Through taxes. Okay, so is it excludable? Kind of gets back to Rachel's thing. Is it excludable? Yes. So Obama could potentially provide a list to the terrorists and say, listen, McCullough hasn't been paying his taxes. You can bomb the hell out of McCullough, but you've got to leave his next door neighbor alone. He's been good about paying his taxes. Is it possible to exclude... People who don't pay from enjoying national defense. No. no. Right? So again, it kind of touches on what Rachel was talking about, that we have public education, and yes, we pay taxes, but at a fundamental level, we've got a non-excludable good. So national defense is one of the classic examples of a public good. National defense. How about a fireworks display? How about a fireworks display? Is it possible to exclude people that don't pay for it? No. No. They can kind of stand around. You can see it for a while. Maybe the fancy show that they do right in front of you is in a stadium and all the cool stuff's there. But the ones that they shoot way up in the air, right? We've got kind of this... Uh, thing that's non-excludable. And is it possible for more than one person to enjoy the fireworks display at one time without detracting from the other's enjoyment? Yeah. So fireworks might fall into this type of category. How about a lighthouse? A lighthouse. So we're at, on the Atlantic Ocean. 
and we've got a lighthouse that's on the on the shore, right? So is it possible to, so what's that, do taxes pay for the lighthouse? Good, good question, maybe. Do we have to worry about who's paying for it when we do this analysis? No. No, no not really. It might come into as part of the analysis when we start thinking about payment. But the main thing is to go back, is it possible to exclude non-payers of enjoying the lighthouse? What does the lighthouse do, by the way? Well, shows you where the shore is. Yeah. So when it's pitch black out and you're three miles from shore and you can't see the shore, hopefully you can see the lighthouse like, oh, we want to head that direction tonight, right? So the lighthouse is non-excludable and non-rival. Multiple ships can use the lighthouse to identify where the shore is. The purpose of the lighthouse can be shared by many people. So the lighthouse might fall into this category. All right, well, what about the park? Let's talk about the park for a second. How about worlds of fun? That's a park. It's, it's excludable. Excludable. If you guys haven't gone there, what do they charge you at the door? Oh, Too much. Like 40 bucks. 38, 40, yeah, my son went to the Halloween thing, and I think it was 38 bucks. So it's definitely excludable. Is it rival or non-rival? Lines get long. Lines get long. But does everybody have to be on the same ride at the same time? No. So the park has some non-rivalry to it. Yeah. So an amusement park might fall here. Do we have a name for that? A golf course might fall here. A movie theater might fall here. Excludable and non-rival. Maybe the classroom. Your college education, college class, yeah. might fall into this category. Now, rival and non-excludable is a little bit tougher. We have the air. Um, we might have some ocean fish. Where if I catch the fish, you can't catch that same fish, right? So the amount of fish out in the ocean might be rival and not able to exclude people from it. So these are called common resources. So common resources. Not necessarily natural resources, but a lot of natural resources might fall into this category, but common resources. And up here, we sometimes have what we call club goods. Club goods. Now, as you look at the list, what's possible, what's the key ingredient needed for the private capitalist system to provide it? What's kind of the key thing needed? As you look at the list, it should kind of jump out at you. What's the key characteristic needed for a free market to be able to provide it? You know, there's people doing their own thing, maximizing their own interests. What do we need? Private goods, but what characteristic? We need rivalry and non. It has to be rival. No, it has to be excludable. It has to be excludable, right? So look at we got amusement park, golf course. These are all run by private businesses. These are all offered by private businesses. So the key thing we need is excludability for the marketplace to handle it. Otherwise, it might be a place for the government to step in. That's where we'll pick up next time.